Welcome back to Module 3. We're going to be continuing our discussion of Chapter 5 from OpenStax Astronomy and the nature of how astronomers study the light from distant objects. Our big goal is to understand how we can break down all the different types of light that an object might send us into different ways to display the data and analyze it. So this process of breaking light down into different pieces actually goes all the way back to Isaac Newton. When we first talked about the nature of light, one of his key experiments that he was doing was sending sunlight through a prism and seeing all the different colors. And his understanding was then that there were red particles and yellow particles and blue particles. And what we now know is that these photons of different energies and different wavelengths can actually spread out if we send that light through a prism. That process happens because of something called refraction, which we'll talk a little bit more about in Chapter 6. Now, when we study the light from an object, like a distant star, there's two main ways that astronomers uh, display that data for themselves to study it, and we learn different things based on those two different ways to display the data. The first that we're going to talk about is black body curves. We're going to talk about what the curve shape is trying to tell us and the overall um, pattern that a star creates. And then we're going to talk about spectral lines and the additional information that we learn when we figure out what lines are missing from a star's spectrum uh, and different ways to, to analyze that. So, before we talk about black body curves as a whole, there's a couple of terms that we need to make sure that we're all on board with. These are terms that you might have learned about in a previous science class, and this is a chance for us to get on the same page. So when we talk about heat, we are talking about a form of energy. Often uh, we might be talking about infrared light when we talk about like us feeling warm and the glow that we produce as human beings. But heat is a description of energy itself, and light is a uh, motion of energy from one place to another. We talked about the word radiation. Temperature, when we talk about a temperature, the true piece of information that we are learning is how much energy an object or an atom or a set of atoms has. So when we talk about temperature scales, we are used to, in our everyday lives, using Fahrenheit. It's not used in science, but I want to kind of give us that context. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We know in winter in Michigan it can get colder than that. Uh, and water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we're making tea and there's some steam coming off, that is water that has boiled and turned to steam. When we shift that to the Celsius scale, which is used in a lot of different sciences, that scale is defined by water. So water freezes at exactly zero degrees Celsius and it boils at exactly 100 degrees Celsius because that is the scale that got created for that purpose. Now to match with all of the different science uh, contexts and the way that equations are presented, astronomers do wanna make sure that one degree of change in the scale that they use matches Celsius, but the words that we care about or the, the temperatures that we care about in astronomy have such a wide ranging um, set of values that we wanna make sure that we can identify because it is relevant to astronomy and the long-term future of the universe, that we can identify when we actually get to zero energy. Remember, heat is a form of energy and temperature is trying to describe that for us. So we define this idea of absolute zero, which means no heat energy whatsoever. And that becomes the start of our scale at zero Kelvin. This is a new scale um, named the Kelvin scale or the absolute scale. So we have to set that zero point to when we have no energy, which means it's not possible to have negative Kelvin. And we're going to still use the Celsius degree changes, so we just shift the Celsius scale. That means that we have to shift everything by 273 degrees, because that is just where that absolute scale um, has to start. So water freezes at 273 Kelvin, and it boils at 373 Kelvin. 
If you're curious for these different scales, absolute zero in terms of Fahrenheit is negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're not going to experience that in our everyday lives. We haven't gotten to it in the lab either, but we've gotten very close, like a fraction of a degree for very short periods of time in high, um, high quality laboratories. So we care about this zero point, this absolute zero Kelvin scale, because any dense object, so solid or very dense object with a temperature above that will create some amount of light because that energy is moving around and the atoms, if they're packed together like that, are going to bump into each other. That glow that simply comes from being dense and hot is called blackbody radiation. We human beings are dense and our um, temperatures are above absolute zero. Uh, so we produce black body radiation that peaks in the radio, um, or peaks in the infrared rather, we are warm, um, and we produce a very, very small amount of those longer energy, uh, lower energy, longer wavelength forms of light. But we don't really glow in the visible. We don't pick up in, with our eyeballs that anybody is glowing. Um, however, light bulbs, standard incandescent light bulbs, work by taking a piece of metal, dense uh, material, and heating it up above absolute zero so that it starts to glow brighter and brighter um, at higher and higher energies. So dense objects include incandescent bulbs. That link um, is to a video that shows a bulb um, being heated up to higher and higher temperature, which changes how it glows. Uh, and this uh, image on the slide shows that same thing as snapshots, where we will have a warm object that might not glow in the visible yet. Like if you first turn an oven on uh, or a stovetop on, uh, like an electric burner, it may be warm even though you can't see that yet. You don't want to touch it uh, because it is still producing a lot of infrared light and that can be painful to our uh, receptors when there's a lot of that uh, infrared light or heat. Uh, and then it's really important to recognize that when we talk about dense objects, we're talking about the cores of stars. So the cores of stars will produce this smooth curve um, that we're seeing. And it will change based on the temperature of the star itself. So that's one of the key characteristics of blackbody radiation. The shape of the curve is specific to blackbody radiation. It's not a simple bell curve. We are not going to get into the math details of the two different sides and the way that they have that shape. That is a relevant part of like advanced uh, astrophysics, not important to our curriculum. But underneath the curve, the total space underneath the curve is related to the temperature also. So the curve will get higher um, at higher temperature. And then much more important to our curriculum goals is this idea that we definitely want to put in our notes that the temperature of that star will determine the peak wavelength. It will determine if the star looks red or looks yellow or looks blue. That determination is based on a fairly simple looking equation Wien's law, and by simple looking, all I mean is that there are two variables and a simple number um, that compares them. The peak wavelength is this number, 3 million, divided by the temperature. So this slide here shows all of the different colors that stars can actually appear. Because of the shape of that curve where we might be producing a lot of all of the colors if we peak in the middle like the sun does, we get a washed out kind of color. The coldest stars that we see will look a lot more reddish orange than other stars. The hottest stars that we can see will look significantly bluer or a clearer white blue than other stars. Orion as a constellation is a really helpful one to look for um, with the reddish star Betelgeuse and the bluish star Rigel on either side of the belt. It's our best opportunity to easily see um, with regular stargazing these color changes because they really are um, visibly different if we know what to look for and we know that we're not expecting this like vibrant fire truck red um, or anything like that. This interactive, I strongly encourage you to look through the posted slides um, and try on your own to make these different colors. And a simple reminder that temperature determines the color, and that is the only thing that determines color. 
All right, so to make sure that all of this information is settling in for us, I want you to read through this question and the options, pause the video for as long as you need to read through it and make a decision, and then uh, we'll talk through it. So the question itself asks us to compare objects of different sizes and objects of different colors or different temperatures to decide which one is redder. Now we need to pull a couple of different pieces of information from this video and the previous video. When we think about red versus blue, the previous video helped us to think through the fact that redder colors would be on the lower energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum and bluer colors, blue and violet, would be on the higher energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum when we're thinking about visible light. That was shown in the previous few slides too, but I want to connect it to that previous um, learning. And in the previous several slides, we have not talked about the size of objects, small stars and big stars. We haven't talked about how that would have any effect um, on color. And in fact, the thing that we highlighted and made sure to write down in our notes is that the temperature determines the color, full stop. That's all that matters. So if we're being asked which one appears redder, the only thing we have to care about is the temperature and redder things are gonna be cooler than bluer things. So that larger, cooler piece of metal appears redder, that's option one, and it has nothing to do with the size. The size is not relevant. Um, it is only the temperature that we care about for that. We will learn in upcoming uh, modules that the brightness of stars has to do with both temperature and size. We would not have enough information if we were being asked which one is brighter. So instead, we just recognize that color is based on temperature. If you haven't written that down in your notes yet, it's probably worth doing. Color is based on temperature. All right. Now, actual true stars are a lot more complex than these smooth curves. They will still peak at a certain wavelength that tells us about its color, um, but they also have these dips in the spectrum that if we were to look at the curve would look like um, drop down and then back up again, or jagged lines. And when we want to understand what's going on there, we have to talk about spectral lines. Now, to understand those, we'll circle back around to talk about what's going on, but to understand those, we have to take a step back and make sure that we have the background information that we need for um, some basic chemistry in the structure of atoms. Then we'll move back into astronomy. So, an atom is the smallest possible sample of a chemical element. And we've probably seen in our lives the periodic table of elements, all these different names for things. So let's make sure that we can connect our understanding of atoms with that um, periodic table idea. An atom has a central nucleus, which is where most of the mass is found, and then an electron cloud surrounding it, uh, which is where we would find electrons. The distance between the nucleus and the electron cloud is extremely vast. An atom is mostly empty space. The picture on the slide is nowhere close to being to scale, the same way that solar system pictures are not drawn to scale either. If we were to imagine an atom and its nucleus um, appropriate scale, we'd have to really think about like a football field or two across is the edges of the electron cloud, the, the far um, end zones and we'd have a little tiny grape seed right in the middle of all of that, and that would be the nucleus. So mostly empty space. The nucleus, though, is that central region that has most of the mass, and it contains two types of things worth writing down. Protons, which have positive charge. Protons determine what element we are talking about. If this image here is showing us that the nucleus has one proton, we look at the periodic table for element number one, and that's hydrogen. Neutrons are kind of function like glue to hold nucleus um, nuclei together. Uh, the number of neutrons is really just changing the mass. It is not changing the element. It does create different versions of elements though. So hydrogen one is what we're showing here, but if we had an extra neutron attached to it, it would be a little bit heavier. Uh, and that would actually be hydrogen two, a different version of hydrogen. And then the electron cloud is where we find electrons. 
there's this statistical understanding of where they're likely to be. They aren't in necessarily just one place at once. Atoms are really complicated and we're not going to go into too much of the details. But for our purposes in astronomy, especially when most of the universe is made out of hydrogen, the simplest element, we are going to use the Bohr model of the atom, which acts like the electrons are kind of in orbit around it at different locations. And that's going to be plenty good for our purposes, not good enough if we're taking a chemistry class or trying to um, deal with complex chemistry applications. So, as I mentioned before, the number of protons determines the element name. So hydrogen, if we looked it up on the periodic table, would have the number one. It has one proton. If we skipped around and we looked at oxygen, it has the number eight. That tells us it has eight protons, no matter how many neutrons are in the nucleus alongside those protons. The number of neutrons does determine the version. The special science name for the versions of elements are called isotopes. We're not going to worry too much about that in our semester. The term won't come up that often. But the isotope number is protons plus neutrons. So on the right here, we see two protons and two neutrons. The two protons tells us that that's helium. And then four total things in the nucleus tells us that that's helium-4. That's as much as we need. The number of electrons determines the overall charge. When we compare how many electrons to how many protons, we can determine whether we have a positive ion or a negative ion. That term ion just describes the fact that they aren't um, matching each other in a neutral atom. But what we really care about in astronomy is not the number of electrons, but rather where electrons are found and how they are moving to different energy levels. Now, when we think about these energy levels, I mentioned uh, that we're talking about the Bohr atom um, model. They don't really orbit. We're not really thinking of them as like different planets in the solar system, but instead the locations that they're allowed to be relative to the central nucleus. In the diagram here on the slide, the central nucleus is not even shown. It would be very small in the very center, too small to see. So instead, we're looking at n equals 1, that's the closest it's able to be, then n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. Those are called energy levels. All right, so now we can start to get into what spectral lines are and where they come from and how we can use them. So as a reminder for our goal for this part of the video, we want to make sure that we can understand how astronomers are using these spectral lines to figure out what elements are present. That's going to be a big goal for us. And then discuss three different types of spectra, three different categories of a spectrum that we might look at and analyze. Those types of spectra um, are shown on the right image here, continuous bright line spectrum, which is also called an emission spectrum and a continuous spectrum with dark lines, which is also called an absorption spectrum. And we'll see other diagrams with those names. All right, so electrons can change energy levels if they are given energy or they release energy. It's kind of like if we're in a staircase, we can go upstairs or we can go downstairs. But once we're on the ground floor, we're not gonna have a basement. Once we're on the ground floor, we can't go any further down. Ground level, the ground uh, state of an atom, is that lowest place that we can go. Um, on the image here, it's indicated as one. That's the lowest possible place electrons are allowed to be. Then we can go up um, the ladder or up the stairs as long as we stop at the landings that are available to us, which is why uh, rungs of a ladder might be easier to think about than stairs because there is no in-between place to stand. Once you put your foot on the next rung, you can set it there, but you can't like put your foot in the middle of two rungs. It will just fall back down again. So if we want to go to, if we want our electrons to go to a higher energy level, we have to give them the right amount of energy. So the photon has to match exactly the gap that it's trying to, um, to accomplish. So a photon will absorb, it will take in a photon, absorb the photon. The electron then has all this energy, wants to go up the ladder, and it will jump up to the appropriate location based on that energy difference. 
But electrons like to be chill, they like to sit in the ground state, so they can spontaneously jump back down to a lower energy level. But to do that, they have to give up that extra energy, they have to let go of it, they emit the photon. Now I want you to stop and look at those two sentences in the bottom right of this slide. If a photon is absorbed, then the electron can jump up to a higher energy level. That's a cause and effect. The photon has to be absorbed, it has to be coming from an outside source in order to get electrons to go up to these higher levels. But then the second sentence is, if the electron jumps down to a lower energy orbital or level, then a photon is emitted. That means that that is also a different cause and effect. The cause is it wants to get back down, and then the effect is the photon is let go. That is not coming from an outside source. So we can naturally and spontaneously go back down to lower energy levels, and then we'll send off light. But in order to have those electrons be brought up to high energy levels, we have to provide them with outside energy. All right, so I said it once before, but the lowest possible energy level that an electron is allowed to be is n equals 1. That's the closest it's able to get to the nucleus, and we call that the ground state. All the other levels are called excited states. So the n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 are the way that we might label the kind of levels of our building here in the U.S., the first floor, second floor, third floor. Other countries, though, they call the ground floor the ground floor, and then if you go one flight of stairs up, that becomes their first floor. The excited states have that kind of weird numbering as well. Not weird, but just offset numbering. The ground state would be called the ground state, here, n equals 2 would be the first excited state. That's our first jump away from the ground state. The transitions from higher energy levels to n equals 2, the first excited state, are called the Balmer series for hydrogen. So here we are displaying the different options for a hydrogen atom. If we go from n equals 3 to n equals 2, that small change in energy produces a low energy photon. It emits a red photon, and we get a red spectral line. From 4 to 2, we get a medium energy photon in the visible that produces a blue-green spectral line. It will look blue-green. And then from n equals 5 down to n equals 2, the electron, in order to jump down that bigger gap, will produce a higher energy um, photon, it will emit a violet photon. So when we see those particular bright lines in a spectrum, we know that hydrogen has to be present. It's a spectral fingerprint. So as we think about these different terms, about things moving around and absorbing and emitting, I want to make sure that we kind of feel confident with these terms and how these motions are happening. So pause the video, read through the question and the options. All right, and hopefully you did pause because it's easy to go through this one too fast. The question says, energy is released from atoms in the form of light when electrons do what? Now, a lot of the time, if we read a little bit too fast or things haven't quite sunk in yet, and there's plenty of time to review, if we go too fast, we often pick option two, that they're emitted by the atom, because our brain has made the correct connection that emission is what we are talking about when we release energy. But it's the photons that are emitted, not the electrons. This question is asking, what are the electrons doing that means photons get emitted? And so for the electrons to give up extra energy, they have to be going from a higher part of the ladder down to a lower part of the ladder, from high energy levels to low energy levels, to be able to release that extra energy as a photon. So that's going to be option four here. All right. So we have gotten enough understanding of what's happening at the atomic level, especially with the electrons, to now identify the three types of spectra that we want to feel familiar with as we continue through the rest of the semester. So we talked about if we have just a high density hot source, like a human being, the center of the earth, or as shown on the slide, an incandescent light bulb that we're heating the metal for, it will create a smooth curve of wavelengths where the peak of that curve tells us the temperature. But when we display the data like this, we aren't looking at the peak um, wavelength. All we see are, are we seeing all of the light or just some of it, or are we missing some of it? So for just the high, high, uh, 
just the hot high density energy source, um, we get a continuous spectrum. All of the colors are present. That's a first potential situation. A second potential situation is if we have a cloud of um, gas out in space that is heated. It has a whole bunch of energy already. What that really is telling us is that the electrons are already at these high energy levels. And they want to chill, they want to cool, they want to calm down. And so electrons from that hot cloud will drop down and the amount of energy that they change, they'll release as a, an emitted photon. And we get the specific wavelengths associated with any change in the latter. So on that previous slide, we had the three different Balmer series lines. Here, um, we're seeing a handful of lines that might be from all sorts of different combinations of bigger um, number wavelength, uh, bigger number energy level to smaller number energy level. That would be an emission spectrum because all we see are emission lines. And then the last possible option for us is we have a hot high density energy source, so maybe a light bulb, but in between the viewer and the source, there is a cloud of cooler gas. That cooler gas is telling us that the electrons might already be in low energy states, maybe the ground state, maybe low excited states, and they have the capacity to take in extra energy by absorbing photons and jumping up to higher energy levels. They will only absorb the photons that are associated with those specific gaps in the ladder. So when they take in those photons and they absorb them, we see missing lines from what they took. And we have absorption lines. And so we have an absorption spectrum, which has mostly the whole rainbow from the original source, like the core of a star. But there are missing pieces also. If you haven't um, had a chance to yet, I strongly encourage you to pause the video here so that you can draw this out in your notes, that you can label the kind of path that the light is traveling and what we call those different types of spectra. All right, so let's apply that knowledge. We have a picture here of the sun's spectrum. This is a picture taken from the ground, but it would be a very similar picture if we were looking at it from um, a satellite. This is what we get produced by the sun, um, that's what sunlight looks like. We kind of read it like a book. Um, all of those different lines would be all lined up next to each other. So looking at that image and our understanding of spectra, but really it's kind of common sense looking at the image, what best describes what we're seeing? So pause to think as long as you need to. Now I hope that when you look at this picture, you see dark lines. You see dark lines with a background of rainbow, and that only matches that third option we had on the previous slide, a dark line absorption spectrum. It also matches our understanding, but I want us to recognize that we should not give up on our common sense. When we have an observation, we should use it. We don't see a smooth rainbow. We don't see mostly black with a few bright lines. We see mostly a rainbow with a handful, a large number of dark lines, but that means it's an absorption spectrum. The core of the sun created the smooth black body radiation, but as it goes through the outer layers of the sun, we're taking pieces out based on the elements that we have. This set of missing lines is telling us what the sun is made out of, which is pretty spectacular. It's how we figure out the composition, what the sun is made out of, and all stars produce absorption spectra. So it's how we study um, what all stars are made out of. Now a follow-up question for you, can we tell the location of the peak wavelength from this image? So that's a yes or no question. You can pause to think about it. And I hope that what we realize is that we don't see that peak wavelength. We know from a previous slide that had the smooth curves that the sun peaks in the kind of yellowish green colors, but that is not represented when we look at the data this way. It is why we have black body curves and separately the spectral line analysis. So a reminder for this section and a summary of it is that there are two useful ways for us to look at the data we get from starlight. A star will have an overall curve to it, a black body curve, and that peak wavelength will tell us the temperature of the star. It's how we can figure out how hot or cold a star is. The color is going to be reflective of the temperature also. And then separately, 
The composition of the star, what elements are present, what the star is made out of, comes from looking at the absorption lines in its spectrum, because all stars are going to produce an absorption spectrum by the time that light leaves. And so we get to learn a lot about stars that way. We've covered plenty of ground for now. In the next video, we'll finish up chapter five, and then the video after that, we'll be talking about telescopes and how astronomers use those tools in order to gather the kind of light that we've been learning about. I'll see you in the next video.